You know, I do think that's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Brian Kiley, and I hope that you will feel comfortable here today. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a... R- Whoa! <laughs> we celebrate. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, including diversity of beliefs, from divine believers to humanists, from pagans to atheists and agnostics. We welcome diversity of age, from infants through young children, sort of through teenagers, adults and into elders. Now we welcome the teenagers. We love the teenagers. We believe in compassion of the human heart, the warmth of community, the pursuit of justice, and the search for meaning in our lives. We gather with gratitude this morning on the traditional creed lands that are now part of Treaty 6 and shared by many nations. City Councilor Aaron Paquette opened a city meeting with a, a treaty recognition this week that was extensive and detailed and uh, is available on, on various websites. I know our President Karen Mills posted it to Facebook and I've reposted it and it's something worth looking at if you have a chance. But it would pretty much take up most of the service to read it here today. These treaties, there are an inheritance, a responsibility and a relationship. So they call on us to be good neighbors to each other, to the generations, to the environment, to the world in which we live. If you're new here, we invite you to stay afterwards for coffee hour to get to know us. If you haven't already done so, please visit the uh, newcomer table just across the hall. They have good information to share. And so as we begin this special hour together, I invite you to quiet your electronic devices so we can all enjoy the service fully. And this week we are fortunate to have a guest, Margaret Fisher, who is a French horn player with Orchestra Borealis, which rehearses here on Wednesday nights. So let us begin with a prelude from uh, Margaret and Gordon. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opening words are by that famous author, Anonymous. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. 
May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. Our first hymn this morning is number 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. 361, and I invite you to stand if you're willing, able, or even mildly interested. I'd like to invite Gordon Ritchie and Robert Begg to come forward and light our chalice this morning. As most of you know, we had the pleasure, all the ministers in this city had the pleasure of reading their wedding service a week ago Saturday. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. <laughs> yeah, the whole wedding was like that. <laughs> I'd like to invite the young folks to come forward and light their chalices, please. As the children leave, let us sing them out with hymn number 396, I Know This Rose Will Open, and we'll sing it through two times. week we take an offering to support the work of this church and the wider community. Half of the unidentified cash that we take in each week we share with some outside organization. And for the month of, uh, what is this, May? For the month of May we've been collecting money for, yes, Youth Emergency Support Services, an agency that's been doing wonderful work in our community, helping kids stay off the street, get off the street, find shelter when they have to leave homes that are not as happy as we all dream of. Let us take an offering to support the work of this church, and yes, and we'll hear another piece.
Thank you. As we receive the offering, would you join in the song printed in your order of service, please? From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. To you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. It is also a tradition in our congregation to mark the joys and the sorrows that do connect us in this life. We do that by inviting people to light a candle for their particular joy or sorrow or feeling or concern or whatever it may be. Today we will have both silent candles and if you wish to wait a minute, we'll have, I'll invite you up separately if you want to share the reason why you're lighting your candle. If you'd like to light a a silent candle, I invite you to come forward now. If there are any here today who would like to share the reason for lighting a candle, I invite you to come forward now. Really? Y'all got it covered? All right. Well, I'm going to light one, and it's going to be totally frivolous. This afternoon, the Edmonton Eskimos play their first preseason game, (laughs) and I will be there. But all the other candles represent things going on in people's lives. Some happy, some sad, some trying, some really, really scary. And it's a reminder to be gentle when we're talking during coffee hour, because we never really know what's going on. But it's also a reminder that everybody out there has something going on. I was walking my dog last night, and this elderly, well, probably 75-year-old gentleman Accosted me in our neighborhood. His name is Bob. Wearing a safety hat. Smoking the butt end of a cigarette. Saw my dog, patted my dog. Said, dogs never bother me. They, they're always friendly to me. I only got bit once. And then talked to me about how his family had come over from Poland, although he's Ukrainian, and how he was so grateful to be in this country. And he was clearly someone who was dealing with a whole raft of issues that you find in the kind of the inner city. And... It's just nice to let them talk. But there are so many people with so many things to share. So let us try and remember that when we go back outside. That there are people who need us just to listen to them now and again. Amen. Meditation this morning is by a Unitarian Universalist minister named Harry Meserve, who was a very prominent figure in our movement in the middle part of the last century. From arrogance, pompousness, and from thinking ourselves more important than we are, may some saving sense of humor liberate us. For allowing ourselves to ridicule the faith of others, may we be forgiven. From making war and calling it peace, special privilege and calling it justice, indifference and calling it tolerance, pollution and calling it progress, may we be cured. For telling ourselves and others that evil is inevitable while good is impossible, may we stand corrected. Spirit of life, spirit of our mixed up, tragic, aspiring, doubting, insurgent lives, help us to be as good as in our hearts we have always wanted to be. Amen. I invite you into a time of silence.
Thank you. The reading this morning is actually a portion of a book review. It's about a book that I haven't read yet. It's on order. But I heard an interview, and I'll talk about that a little more in the sermon. It gave me hope. The book's called A Thousand Small Sanities. The reading's by Gabino Iglesias. Liberalism and liberals are under attack. In the current political landscape, the attack is coming from both right and left and rides a wave of events that threaten democracy and that have produced a mounting crisis of faith in liberal institutions while criticizing the core of liberal thought. A Thousand Small Sanities by Adam Gottnick stands against this charge. Gopnik demonstrates how liberalism is more than a term for political centrism or the idea of free markets. A concerned, ever-expanding search for positive, inclusive changes at all social and political levels. Gopnik presents liberalism not only as a moral adventure, but as a necessity in an age of resurging autocracy and rampant bigotry. Gopnik wants readers to understand liberalism. However, liberalism is many things. Throughout this book, he explores its history and explains its need, but he never loses sight of the main goal, making people understand what it is, because understanding it is understanding the need for it. To achieve this, he defines and redefines liberalism in various ways tying it to human condition, to our growing set of problems, and the shifting political realities. He writes, Liberalism is a fact-first philosophy with a feelings-first history. Liberal humanism is a whole in which the humanism always precedes the liberalism. Powerful new feelings about a compassionate connection to other people, about community, have always been informally shared before they are crystallized into law. Social contacts precede social contracts. Understanding the emotional underpinnings of liberalism is essential to understanding its political project. Gabino goes on, one of the ideas at the center of this book is that liberalism's main goal from a socio-political standpoint is reform and that liberals, quote, believe in the possibility of reform and think of it as something that is always going to be essential and constantly required. Gopnik again, the next reform is necessary not because we changed our views, but because new kinds of cruelty are always coming into existence or into view. Our sights sharpen, our circles of compassion enlarge. No sane society ever reaches a secure balance point. We always need change. The process of reform is never ending, not because we're always searching for utopia, but because as the growth of knowledge alters our conditions, we need new understandings, to change out plans. I want to invite you into a community question. The the theme this month has been curiosity, which curiously has been difficult to always stick to the theme. But I suppose if I had a curiosity when I was starting this service and into the future, it was, where am I going to find hope? Where am I going to find positivity? feels like we're fighting an uphill battle now. Now, that might not be true for you. You might think things are going along great. Perfectly good opinion for you to have. But I want to ask you all just to turn to your neighbors or groups of two or three or four and just have a conversation for a few minutes about where are we going? What's your hope for the future? And do you have optimism or pessimism about getting there? I'll give you 90 seconds. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Take a few minutes and solve that problem, okay?
I like it. That was a two-gong conversation. That's good. <laughs> it's always nice when that happens. I think uh, we, we borrowed this idea from actually a United Church congregation about two years ago, and this might be the best single change we've introduced into our services in the last several years. And um, may not be everybody's cup of tea, but then uh, we're having a worship conversation after the service or a little worship training planning thing. And the, the axiom is not every element is going to please every person, but this seems to please a lot of people. So good. Let's join in singing hymn number 159, This Is My Song, a song I've always found to be incredibly optimistic in dark times. 159. Over the past few weeks, my wife Erica and I have both found ourselves shying away from the news. There just hasn't been much to lift our spirits. Wildfires, a new provincial government that disappoints us with almost every announcement, a federal political scene that is a comedy of errors and ineptness on all sides. Then there is the United States climate change, deteriorating international relations pretty much everywhere. Looking at the present, much less towards the future, has just gotten emotionally difficult. Even my eternal and unfailing optimism has been both shaken and stirred. I find myself ignoring the big picture, hiding away from it even, and focusing instead on small things where I can make a contribution and feel useful, like chopping up vegetables at Meals on Wheels. It's no secret that politically I am a small L liberal. We did a whole series on it in the fall. It goes with my interpretation of Unitarian theology. I place my faith in the goodness of people, the kind of humanism that was being discussed in the reading. I affirm the inherent worth and dignity of all. I affirm justice, equity, and especially compassion in human relations. I affirm a free and responsible, responsible search for truth and meaning, a search that actively engages with new ideas and ways of being. And I affirm that we are all part of the interdependent web. What happens in one environment, whether it's natural, political, or economic, affects every being on the planet. Therefore, we must use as much caution and wisdom in decision-making as we can, understanding that even our best intentions are not always going to be successful, and the law of unintended consequences shows up now and again. 
But you know, I'm not seeing much caution or wisdom in the headlines these days. I believe that good people will eventually win the day and move our human condition forward again. We won't win every day. We won't win every battle. But my understanding of history suggests that this has been the path with stops and starts and backward slides. This has been the path that humanity has been following. As the Unitarian minister Theodore Parker once wrote in a quote later made famous by Martin Luther King Jr., the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That is where I place my faith. We won't get there in my lifetime, but we will move civilization forward a little. We already have. Gordon and Robert got married here last week. It seems that the progressive movement might not be gaining any more momentum this year or maybe even in the next four years. But... Being liberal, as I said last fall, means that I place a lot of my eggs in the baskets of rationalism, scientific fact, and negotiation in honest goodwill. That stems from affirming the inherent worth and dignity of every person, one of our principles. Every person, even the political leaders I don't like. We have to negotiate with goodwill and good faith. And these days, that faith in the goodness of people is being sorely tested. The obvious stress comes from the great rightward swing in so many governments. We seem to be returning to an age of the strongman politics, or where that doesn't exist, we just see utter chaos, as in the Brexit fiasco. These touch so many issues, the strong man or the chaos. Brexit, Brexit is noted, immigration in the U.S., the entire existence of the American president, women's rights to choose, public education, the noise of war drums growing ever more intensive, Edmonton's Pride Festival. Show me an area that is not rife with polarized contention and I will probably fall down on my knees and shed tears of gratitude. About five years ago, I remember speaking of how there was no hope of resolving Alberta's oil patch woes if all that happens is that the two lobbies simply sit behind their walls of certainty lobbing verbal bombs at the other side. This terrible polarization means that the center has been all but vacated as so many on the left have swung to their own form of illiberal extremism. They are matching the ultra-right in invective and abandoning the principles that can build bridges. Extremist forces of both left and right have dominated the debate and forced an evacuation of the political center and the rhetorical center as well, leaving the moderate majority, and I believe in the moderate majority, rudderless and leaderless. I feel kind of alone. Government in so many places has become an exercise in empty posturing where the lowest priority seems to be actually governing the country. The American government is all but ground to a halt, wasting the election of a Democratic House of Representatives. Ultra-left Democrats are tearing their party apart in their passionate anti-Trump rhetoric, just as ultra-right people have forced Republicans out of the center. Look at U.S. news for a few days and you'll see virtually nothing but politicians attacking one another, often in the same party. And meanwhile, the discussion of... Oh, actual policy or making actual laws has all but dropped off the radar, except in anti-choice red states. And it's not much better north of the border. Weakness in the face of scandal and infighting has killed the legislative agenda in Ottawa. All parties are in full election mode with an election still six months away. MPs seem to have forgot, forgotten the mission of making Canadian lives better. They are more interested in stoking either anger or fear in the electorate. 
the center has been vacated. And provincially, well, here and in Ontario, mostly it's a case of a government by knee-jerk repeal. If the other side wanted it, then we've got to get rid of it. Now, how stupid and short-sighted is that? Where's the goodwill? Where's the negotiation? Where's thinking about what's actually best for Ontarians or Albertans or anybody else? And when we go in this destructive direction, well-meaning people get targeted and victimized by these polarized forces. This week, our Prime Minister went to Saskatchewan to exonerate and apologize for the false conviction of Chief Poundmaker. Poundmaker who stopped his braves from ambushing the police. Poundmaker who might be better called peacemaker was jailed because polarized forces needed someone to hate and someone to blame. And I wonder if a few decades from now, a future government is going to have to apologize to someone of this generation for the injustice and the vilification done to them. I am so frustrated by all of this nonsense. My worldview is predicated on a willingness to listen to other people's views. And I don't mean politely letting someone to speak while I'm suppressing yawns. I mean listening with an openness to the possibility of changing opinions and changing actions. Not theirs, mine. Maybe they will change my opinion with a good argument and a good set of facts. I mean listening with a goal to finding win-win solutions, inclusive solutions. And I mean listening with an openness to completely different ways of solving problems. I mean looking at evidence, evidence fairly and honestly presented by all sides of of a debate. I mean realizing that sometimes I need to step back and let somebody else try their ideas. I've noticed this in my own collegial ministry with my my younger colleagues, that it's my time coming to step back and let them do the leading and try new ideas and see where that leads. I mean being willing to compromise when it's feasible. And I mean knowing that leaders are sometimes going to make wrong decisions with the best of intentions. Wrong decisions can and are made by good people. But sometimes... Leaders just have to be able to learn how to say, I'm sorry, we got that wrong. Haven't seen a lot of that. Mostly we see blaming and finger pointing instead. Now I also know that historically the pendulum swings from one side to the other, from conservatism to liberalism. That's probably a good thing, helping us find balance. And no government lasts forever and no philosophy dominates for too long. After the darkest night, whatever your political view, after the darkest night, the sun does rise again. It's just, right now it feels like it's three o'clock in the morning, dawn is a long time away, and it's pouring down rain out of heavy clouds, not promising a very bright morning, even when it comes. And then I heard this interview, Anna Maria Tremonti, my favorite person in the world, with a man named Adam Gopnik. He was a fellow Montrealer, born just a couple months after me. We grew up in the same political and cultural environment. And listening to him, maybe that bright dawn seemed just a little more possible. As I said, the book is still coming to me. I haven't read A Thousand Small Sanities, but I am looking forward to it. One other reviewer describes it as the search for radical change by humane measures. By humane measures. That is music to my ears. David Frum was asked to review his book. David Frum, of course, is a Canadian political commentator living in the United States, uh, a conservative, but a sensible conservative, if I may. He's not a, he's not a radical. He's not a nut bar. <laughs> he writes... Adam Gopnik wants to smite the authoritarian populists. He wants to assimilate and domesticate the illiberal left to the maximum extent he can. In other words, he wants to reestablish the center. I may be a little left of center, and this speaks to me. 
I resonate with his dismissal of authoritarian populists who seem to be forming one government after another right now. Gopnik writes, this is not a special feature of one era or another. Strongman politics and boss man rule in simplest form is the story of mankind. In our time, he writes, boss man rule looks simply squalid. Quote, how paltry its avatars can seem and how ridiculous and trivial their guiding ideas so often are. It's all half-witted tweets and Berlusconi-style clowning. Okay, I could just sit with that quote for a long, long time. (laughs) The real problem and challenge for Gopnik is the increasingly illiberal left. It is that group that's lost its focus. The far left spends spends its time slicing their pie of moral outrage into ever thinner pieces, completely forgetting to look at the value of the whole pie itself. It's not that their specific concerns are wrong. They aren't. They need to be addressed too in their time. It's that so many have become so focused on small victories that they can't come together and see the larger vision anymore. The idea of seeking after the greater good for the greatest number is as absent on the far left as it is on the far right. Both sides chase their tails ignoring or attacking the other side. And Gopnik describes the result as the basic American situation in which the right wing wants cultural victories and gets nothing but political ones, while the left wing wants political victories and only gets cultural ones. The left manages to get sombreros banned from college parties, while every federal court in the country is assigned far right wing activist judges. I should mention Gopnik is now working in the United States at New York University. A most hopeful aspect of Gopnik's cheerful radio interview, however, was his reminder that the strongman trend in the Western world cannot continue. It's never lasted for too long. That kind of leader comes to power by making promises to a base that far outstretch the power available. Hmm, does that sound familiar? When the base becomes disillusioned, there is an attempt to use totalitarian tactics of regression and repression. But they, too, only work for so long. He points out that Hitler and the other dictators of that time were defeated by military forces that were informed by liberal humanism. Communism also fell apart under the weight of its own unfulfilled promises, as did slavery, the robber baron economy. Well, okay, that's back again. And I would add the kinds of racist forces that sent Chief Poundmaker to jail. This kind of authoritarian populism can only last so long until it collapses under its own weight. The thing is, today, I think the length of time it might be surviving depends less on the disillusionment of the right-wing base and more on the left's unwillingness to set aside small issues in favor of addressing the larger shared picture. And should the time come when our liberal humanism manages to coalesce a little bit and returns to power in our consciousness as well as in our government, its success will depend on a united center-left understanding that only so much can be done at once, that not everybody's issue is going to be addressed in Bill 1. For me, it again comes back to Unitarian Universalist principles, remembering to work with and for the inherent worth and dignity of all, not just a few, but all. The emphasis has to be on the all, on the collective. Not every particular need can be at the top of the agenda. Not every particular need can even be solved by government. Some issues can only be resolved at the grassroots level. By us going out and meeting our neighbors, meeting the bobs in our neighborhood, and working through basic human issues together. Demanding or expecting that governments will fix everything for us is unrealistic and divisive. We have to do some of the work that we are capable of doing. 
the Hope Mission block parties, our food bank distributions, are two ways that people in this church keep the faith and work for that principle of human worth and dignity. By coming together to address those problems where they can have a small but meaningful impact, we make a positive contribution to the moral arc of the universe. It's action that addresses human need in times of human crisis. It's people helping people without regard for politics or rhetoric or background or color or religion or any other thing that we can use to divide us. It's people who will help us find the center again. And in the future, well, I can't say that I've been shaken out of my depressive lethargy just yet. Current events are still mostly depressing. But thinkers like Adam Gopnik surely help me find at least a little bit of hope. He reminds me that we all have a part to play by speaking, and more importantly, by listening, by tearing down the walls we've built and working to have general, genuine bridge-building conversations. Will it be easy? <laughs> no, and hell no. Will it make the world better in a hurry? <laughs> Not a chance. But each time we try, we help that arc of the universe bend towards justice. So let's sing a little bit positively and hopefully. In the Teal Hymnal, number 1028, The Fire of Commitment. Written by one of those young whippersnapper ministers who are, I'm letting lead the charge. 1028, The Fire of Commitment. Our chalice is extinguished. But you know, the real value of that chalice is what you do with that light. It's up to you to take it out these doors and share it with those you know, with those you like, with those you don't like, with the world 
that needs the kind of liberal views that we have to offer. Let us join hands and sing Carry the Flame, and then I ask you to take your seats. We'll have a couple of announcements, but I think they'll be short. Oh, right, I'm sorry. We forgot to appreciate and acknowledge Margaret Fisher. I, I am amazed that after that rendition of Amazing Grace, you still have like a liver. That looked like a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you too, Gordon.